Contemporary Amperex Technologies, or CATL, is China's leading EV battery supplier. As of this writing, it is the only Chinese EV battery company that has begun to export its products abroad. It is interesting to consider that one of China's most valuable companies makes, of all things, batteries. When we think about high value add, technically complicated things, we think about iPhones or other tech, not exactly batteries. But as it turns out, batteries are surprisingly complicated to make. In this video, we're going to look at how Cadle manufactures one of their EV batteries. But first, I want to talk about the Asianometry Patreon. If you like what this channel does, you can support the work by joining the Early Access tier. Early Access members get to see new videos and selected references for them before they are released to the public. There is also a general support tier, and signing up for that would be amazing too. So head on over to the Patreon page and take a look. I deeply appreciate anything you'd be able to sign up for. Thank you, and on with the show. The Chinese battery giant was founded in the small city of Ningde, Fujian, and the city is still the company's biggest production base, housing three of their manufacturing facilities. Those are Ningde Zhangwan District, Ningde Chili Bay, and Ningde Fuding. But the company has greatly expanded outside those city borders in an attempt to be a leading global enterprise. In addition to the three Ningde facilities, there are three others in China, Liang City in Jiangsu, Yibing City in Sichuan, and Qinghai, and one other in Germany. And despite challenging economic conditions, they have continued to invest in expanding production and raw materials. At the start of the year, they announced that they would invest $4.4 billion into expanding current facilities or building new sites. Shortly thereafter, in February 2021, the company announced that they would also build a new production facility in Zhaoqing City, Guangdong. This facility is coincidentally near a cluster of automobile makers in the Guangdong Pearl River Delta region including a Xiaopeng Motors EV factory. Then in September 2021, Cato announced a 2.1 billion USD investment in the construction of a new 1,300-acre production facility in Yichen City, Jiangxi. The factories would produce batteries and battery materials. So the company is moving fast to grow its production capacity within China. We will talk more on what else Cato is doing to shore up its advantages but how about we first talk about the manufacturing process of an EV battery? The EV battery supply chain has three parts to it. Cell manufacture, module manufacture, and finally, pack assembly. The cell is the smallest and most important component of the overall battery. It contains the cathode, anode, and electrolyte packed together in a certain way. Multiple cells are then packed together into a module. The exact number of cells per module varies depending on the manufacturer. Some do 4, others can do as much as 12. After the modules are created, they are put into the final battery pack, along with electrical connections and cooling equipment. These can be done manually or with automated equipment. Of these three steps, module and pack assembly add less value to the overall manufacturing process, respectively contributing just 11% and 14% of the battery's overall cost. So that leaves cell manufacture as the most valuable step of the battery manufacturing process. When it comes to lithium ion battery cells, there are two types in wide manufacture. They are largely distinguished by their cathodes. Most EV batteries have cathodes made of either lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxides, hereby referred to as NMCs for my own sanity, or lithium iron phosphates. The former are known for their higher energy density, but have certain trade-offs in terms of sustainability and safety. The latter are cheaper and have certain safety advantages. Cato makes both types, supplying five of China's major car companies, but their current strength is in lithium iron phosphates, as the world's largest supplier of the product. Furthermore, battery cells can be made in a variety of designs, cylindrical, pouch, and prismatic. Panasonic slash Tesla do cylindrical, LG Chem and SK do pouch types, Cato generally makes prismatic batteries. Despite this, the manufacturing process is largely the same. For the various steps within the battery cell manufacture process, you can categorize them in three ways, electrode preparation, cell assembly, and battery electrochemistry activation. Let's go through them. 
Electroproduction is for producing the cell's anodes and cathodes. These two are produced in different production lines, but their subprocesses are the same. For each electrode, we mix the electrode's components, called the active material, with a polymer binder, solvent, and a conductive additive into a mixer. Then you mix it for several hours so that you end up with a uniform electrode slurry. The binder is for making sure the slurry reaches the desired viscosity and homogeny. Without this, the slurry might not properly adhere to something called a collector foil, which we will need in the next subprocess. The solvent is for dissolving the binder. For anodes, simple water can be used for the solvent. But for cathodes, a common organic solvent like N-methylpyrrolidone, or NMP, is used. Keep in mind, however, that NMP is a toxic substance and its emissions are regulated. So, an additional step has to be implemented later on to prevent this from being released into the environment and poisoning people. After the slurry is prepared, the slurry is then coated onto both sides of the aforementioned collector foil. For anodes, the foil tends to be made of copper. For cathodes, the foil is made of aluminium. The coating is pretty important to the whole process. If the slurry is not free of particles or is consistently applied, then the battery will not perform to spec and might even become dangerous. The coated foils are then put onto drying equipment to evaporate away the solvent. For the anodes, water is used for the solvent and can be safely evaporated away. But cathodes, as I mentioned earlier, require an additional step to deal with the toxic NMP. For efficiency reasons, the electrodes are often prepared on wide rolls much larger than what can be stuffed into a single cell. So they then need to be cut to their desired width with knives. Then the electrodes are placed into a dry room with dried separators to prepare for cell assembly. In the cell assembly stage, the electrodes and separator are winded, stacked, and welded layer by layer to create the cell's internal structure. For instance, to create the Z-stacked pouch style battery cells, the anodes and cathodes are cut into single sheets. The separator is fed in as an infinitely folding ribbon with the electrodes added in between the spaces. Once this is done, the ends or tabs of each cell's anode, cathode, and separator have to be welded together. Usually this is done with ultrasonic welding. It is then placed into the pouch or whatever enclosure the cell uses and filled with the liquid electrolyte. Then the cell enclosure is sealed. The steps in the electrochemistry activation stage are for ensuring that the battery's internal structure is stable and that it is ready for use in the real world. The first and most important step is formation. Here, the cell gets charged for the first time. Then it is slowly discharged and recharged at different rates over several cycles. This is crucial to help formulate a solid electrolyte interface layer, often shortened to SEI, that protects the anode from reacting with the electrolyte and forming lithium dendrites, which are known to cause fires. This formation process creates gas within the battery cell and that gas needs to be slowly and safely expelled with external pressure, or else problems will happen. After this, the cells are placed onto aging shells for stabilization. Final tests are applied, the cell is cleaned, and the last bits of gas expelled so to make sure that its internal structure is stable. After this, the cell is ready to go out for installation into modules and packs. Cato is pushing so hard to expand its footprint because there are significant scaling advantages on the cost side. Battery manufacturing has many different process steps and that presents its challenge. Not all of the steps can cycle through their workflow as fast as the others. For instance, consider the coating process, where the slurry is slathered onto the metal foil, and the stacking process, where the finished dried electrodes are folded over into their structure. The former is done on large rolls that can move relatively fast. The latter is a high precision pick and place operation. The machine doing it has to do it right or else the battery will short circuit. These two steps cannot go at the same speed and thus create a bottleneck. Being able to bring larger capacity to these bottlenecked steps means more batteries can be manufactured within the single fast depreciating facility. It means the chance to experiment and implement cost-efficient measures within the overall process, and so on. 
One big challenge that Cato faces is that it does not maintain a direct relationship with the end users. The battery is the most important part of the EV, the single biggest differentiating factor in cost and performance. But in the end, the customers are driving the car, not the battery. EV makers know this, and many of them also know that their product's core differentiation is dependent on a foreign third party. The chip shortage has gotten a lot of press lately, but there also exists a mild EV battery shortage too. This has affected their ability to churn out enough cars for their liking. This incentivizes the manufacturers to eventually bring that work in-house. Cato recognizes this and has implemented a number of different steps to prevent itself from getting cut out of the chain entirely. The first is to establish strategic alliances and share equity. These are very common in the overall EV industry. Think Panasonic and Tesla, BYD and Toyota, and so on. Last year in 2020, Cato struck an alliance with Honda to conduct joint R&D and development of batteries for EVs. Crucially, Cato agreed to issue to Honda 1% ownership of its own shares for 570 million USD, a stake today worth nearly 2 billion USD. The second method has been to consume more of the value within the EV battery manufacturing chain. In other words, more vertical integration. This way, they can offer a more complete, and thus locked in, solution to their end users. This seems to be extending beyond the work done with modules and battery packs. One interesting item announced at the same time of the Yichan City investment that went under the radar was that Cato is working alongside a variety of Chinese technology companies to found a joint venture called Suzhou Times Xin'an Energy Technology. Cato owns a majority share of this JV with 54%, so they are leading the effort. Its goal would be to develop new EV drive control systems. The drive system is one of the most important parts of the entire EV. It is made up of the EV battery, motor, transmission, and power electronics. This is the engineering heart of the system. Foxconn is doing something similar, building an EV platform open to manufacturers to use for their own cars. I have written about their efforts in a previous newsletter email, worth checking out if you're interested. Cato being able to offer its end users not just the EV battery pack, but the entire EV drive system would be a massive value add. Another critical thing that Cato has been doing in order to shore up its manufacturing and cost advantages has been to secure the best and cheapest supply of raw chemical goods for its batteries. The raw materials making up the battery, particularly the cathode, are critical to its performance and final cost. It is generally estimated that the cathode's active materials make up over 30% of its final cost. Furthermore, they are not exactly super plentiful, so the company has worked on securing reliable, low-cost supply for these rare goods. Remember that lithium battery base in Yichan City, Jiangxi, from earlier in the video? Yichan City is known for its rich reserves of lapidolite, a lithium-bearing material. The area is sometimes referred to as the lithium capital of Asia. The company has also made direct investments in companies and mines to secure its raw goods supply. For instance, to guarantee its supplies of lithium, Cato owns 25% equity share in Tianqi Lithium of Sichuan. Along with direct investments in lithium mines in Canada, Australia, and the United States. The company guaranteeing its position has the lowest cost supplier will make it so that end users have to use them, even if it is strategically unwise, like the TSMC of EV batteries. Cato's success has enriched many. Today, the company is one of China's most valuable companies with a market cap of 180 billion USD on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. Robin Zheng, its founder, is now one of Hong Kong's richest men. But the company faces fierce competition from old foes like BYD, from customers who might be competitors like BMW and Audi, from well-funded foreigners like Panasonic and LG Chem, and from fast-rising up-and-comers like Guoshen High Tech, China's number three EV battery maker. Cato is doing its best to fight them all off. They are pushing up capacity to flood the market, signing raw material deals to secure the cheapest supply, and conducting R&D in things like sodium ion batteries to keep from being disrupted out of the market. For now, these measures appear to be succeeding. We shall see if it will be enough and if they might remain the market leader in the years to come. All right, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing.
The feed will show you a bunch of other videos from this channel that might fit your interest. Want to send me an email? Drop me a line at john at asianometry.com. I love reading your emails. Introduce yourself, suggest a topic, or more. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.